All right. Well, I have to say, I have been looking forward to this moment for a long time. Um, in 1942, J.I. Rodale wrote some words on a chalkboard. J.I. Rodale said that healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. These words have been the guiding principles of the Rodale Institute for over seven decades. And we've been unwavering in our mission to demonstrate to the world that there is an inextricable link between the soil, the health of the soil, and the health of humanity. What J.I. Rodell was really saying is that the way that we treat the soil says something about the way that we treat ourselves. I would argue that we're not treating ourselves very well right now as a species. About a year ago, I was commuting to the office and listening to a podcast that came up in my feed. And honestly, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I thought to myself, who was this guy? A medical doctor talking about soil health? What? Um, I felt like he was singing J.I.'s song. I had to meet this guy. So of course, when I got to the office, I sent the podcast to everyone on my team, and I said, like I did every other week, I said, this is mandatory listening. Right, Diana? <laughs> they actually, this time it was true, this was a damn good podcast. So I finally, I said, finally, I thought, a medical doctor talking about regenerative organic agriculture as a solution. And then through a mutual connection, I was later introduced to Dr. Zach Bush. And last December, my wife and I had the opportunity to spend three days with Zach and his team in Virginia. And we began to connect the dots on what is now a working relationship between Rodale Institute and the work that Zach is all about. And uh, Zach and his lovely wife, Jen, and his executive director, David, have made a very long trip, a red eye, to be here with all of us tonight. And it just means the world to the Institute to have you all here. So allow me to preface this by saying that Zach absolutely hates having his bio read, so I'm going to read it really quickly. Um, he's one of the most humble and grounded people that I know. and. Um, Above all, I think what Zach would want you to know about him is that he's a human being with a, a deep spiritual foundation that guides everything he does, including his work. So in a minute, we're going to roll a trailer to a global documentary that was launched by Zach and his team called Farmer's Footprint. Many of us in the room tonight had the opportunity of watching that film today, and there will be several more uh, episodes of that documentary forthcoming. And I encourage each and every one of you in this room to go home tonight and visit farmersfootprint.us to watch the full documentary and please, please support their work too. So now allow me to introduce Zach. Zach Bush, MD, is one of the few triple board certified physicians in the United States. He is an internationally recognized educator on the intersection of the microbiome with disease and our food production systems. His work is finding root cause solutions to the mega industries such as big farming, Big Pharma and Western Medicine. Zach is an activist, an environmentalist, and encompasses profound spiritual wisdom that all ties into creating a regenerative future of health for the planet and for our children. In my humble opinion, Zach isn't just one of the most compelling medical minds currently working to improve our understanding of human and, and planetary health. He's a profound healer, a master in consciousness, and a gift to humanity. So with that, I please encourage all of us to offer a warm Rodale Institute welcome to Dr. Zach Bush. Pleasure, pleasure to be among such an illustrious crowd. Um, just a stunning history with these award winners tonight, what effort has been laid before us and the decades, uh, an honor to be among these award winners tonight. Uh, but tonight we also want to just recognize the power of being human and what an unusual moment we are in. The, the fossil record would suggest that we've been here for 200,000 years, give or take a little bit. And as a species, we did something fascinating, is we started to categorize all the other species. And we're staying in this amazing home of J.I. Rodale uh, today and this evening. 
and you go through that library and uh, you note how, how much effort has gone into categorization of the world that we live in, the types of species that are there, the types of uh, creatures that live in our soils and in our bodies. It's truly a stunning array, but it's so fascinating that our species has gone about the meticulous effort of identifying the, the tens of thousands of species of butterflies or whatever it is. But we went on to name ourselves Homo sapiens, but then in dissecting Homo sapiens, we really realized, well, there was actually a division early on in Homo sapiens, and we're actually Homo sapiens sapiens. We're a division of Homo sapiens, and we thought that we couldn't think of a better name for ourselves than sapiens, so we just repeated it. We're the Homo sapiens sapiens which of course means the wise ones, right? And then you listen to what we just heard from our award winners, both from the inner city environments and our small farm environments, all the way to our pediatricians and, and the medical practices and the toxicity we see there. How wise have we been? Have we lived up to Homo sapiens sapien yet? And I would argue that if we look through our history of mankind of 200,000 years ago, we way predating the chemical agriculture era, we started a practice of destroying life. We have been on a war path against biology on the planet. Anything that wasn't Homo sapiens sapiens, we chose to see as our enemy. And we have been marching against biology on the planet. We have been in literal warfare with the planet since our origin. And there's been pockets of wisdom in our indigenous peoples around the planet that came to understand that they were not at war with, but they were at one with, in a dynamic and ever-changing environment and, and, and an ever-changing ecosystem of biology. And then Western civilization got a foothold. And do you guys remember where your Western Civ textbooks tell you began the, the Industrial Revolution, where it all began, where Western civilization as we know it today started, 900 AD, the plow. It's not weird. The plow is marked as the turning point of modern society because the plow suddenly allowed farmers to to dig up far greater amounts of space in a short amount of time, and that convenience created by the plow allowed an individual to grow more food than was needed by their family for the first time. And so suddenly we could have subspecialization on a very large scale. And so we developed clergy, and we developed scientists, and we developed all of these different subsets of specialty, and we started to subspecialize ourselves down. We are now 1,100, plus years into this subspecialization. And somewhere in that journey, we completely lost the forest for the trees. In our passion and reward of subspecialization, we forgot perhaps what it is to be human. We forgot certainly what sapiens means. We forgot to live up to our own name. And we started to just go after the pursuit of more and more niche, tiny knowledge Ten years ago, if you had met me, I was at the University of Virginia. I was 17 years into my academic career. I was still at the very bottom of the rung of academic positioning. And I was a scientist in the labs most of the days of the week, and twice a week I had a half-day clinic. And in that journey of subspecialization, I was one of two people in the world that was specializing in a protein called CoopTF1. Who's heard of CoopTF1? Crickets. Freaking crickets. 17 years, $200,000 of school debt, and I was studying a protein that nobody will ever know because it's completely irrelevant to our story. But we are paid only to know the irrelevance now. I was literally forced down into that niche where I would study a molecule that I would have to claim to the NIH was the most important thing for the future of cancer research and chemotherapy development so that I could get funding. And I got good at that story. I told that story over and over again. And so they flew me to Japan to literally talk to the other 20 people on Earth that cared about Coop TF1. Keep in mind there's 7.2 billion people on the planet and they could only find 20 that cared about Coop TF1. That's the problem of subspecialization that started with a plow. And what did the plow do? 
the plow in the end, as we find out from Rodale and all of our new soil science, was the beginning of the end of human health. It was the disruption of the biodiversity and the microbiome of the soil 1,100 years ago that started a vulnerability in our bodies. We began a march away from biodiversity in our own bodies and food systems 1,100 years ago. And the diseases that brought our average life expectancy down to 48 years by 1900, which was pathetic because we know by you know, many, many historic records that the Chinese were living to 120 years, thousands of years ago. But in the United States, we had marched that 120-year life expectancy down to just a mere 48 years because of the vulnerabilities that we had created in our immune systems by destroying food systems hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And if you look at tuberculosis and you look at cholera, they only happy, happen in these large urban centers. And so the further that we got away from growing our own food and diversing ourselves from some process and participation in that, the more vulnerable to disease we became. And so in the 20th century, we created this extraordinary story of pharmacy. We said there's going to be these chemicals that we're going to invent and we're going to start to extract these chemicals from the microbiome, the biology, the bacteria, the fungi. We're going to extract these from the plants themselves. And we're going to change those molecules so that we can patent them, commercialize them, and make billions of dollars. And that way we can build an economy so that we can educate our children better. And so I consider my education, which was ridiculously long as you heard tonight, that three subspecialties, all of that junk, was the culmination of generations of wealth building on the modernization of nature. We decided we were going to modernize Mother Earth. We were going to change and manipulate the science of nature itself so that we could control it and we could manipulate it. What was penicillin? Penicillin came from bread mold. Mold. It was really the beginning of the end of our relationship with the pharmaceutical, with the, the microbiome, was, was the, the sequestration of a chemical that was made by bread mold and the monetization of that. And now you look at all the chemotherapies, metformin is a good example for diabetes. It's an extract from uh, the lining of bark, you know, of a, a very specific plant. And we extract these things and we manipulate their molecular form and then we go on to monetize those into multi-billion, billion dollar commodities. And then we pay more and more money for better cars so that we can drive our kids to school. I took a school bus on good, good days in my book. On the bad days, I was always riding my bike. Right? We now drive our children and our grandchildren to school because we forgot that maybe they could actually be in community too on the way to school. And so I'm fascinated by as we march away from biodiversity, as we march away from the microbiome and we continue to monetize mother nature and manipulate it for our own, what happens at the macro scale is fascinating. We end up monocultured ourselves. We are building walls against each other. Homo sapiens sapiens are masters of dividing ourselves. If you put three people in a room, even if they are the exact same skin color, exact same genetic makeup, 99.997% identical, all of us across the globe, we will quickly figure out ways to categorize the three people in the room and decide that we're better or worse than the other couple people in the room with us. We do this automatically. It's this wild homo sapien behavior of categorization and distancing ourselves from everything else around. And so we find ourselves at a tipping point. What was just described by Philip Lanigan, Lanigan, we are at a tipping point. In 1974, right before we debuted Roundup, the glyphosate molecule on the market, one in 5,000 children in America had autism. Now, in my short lifetime, we see one in 30 children with autism spectrum disorder. And we were arguing by 2008 and 2010 when I was in academia that maybe this was just because we were, had defined this, ca this category of disease really well, so we were diagnosing it more. But I work now with 
Thinking Moms Revolution with our, our biotech group working on soil biochemistry to reverse autism. And in working with these mothers, and in working in my clinic every week, I can tell you that what we did not miss in 1975 was autism. Mothers in 1975 did not fail to recognize that their children suddenly lost all verbal skills at 18 to 20 months of age, that suddenly could not look them in the face, could suddenly be so overwhelmed emotionally that they were hitting their, hitting their head on their crib or wall of the house for six to eight hours a day to create enough pain to focus their mind in to, so they could filter out the sensory overload that their brains were in. The doctors I don't have much faith in. They may have missed that in 1975, but the mothers of 1975 did not miss this. And so I believe this is the canary in the coal mine. We can argue that, oh, cancer is being overdiagnosed because we have CAT scans and MRIs, and that's hard to prove against because we didn't have CAT scans and MRIs. We had mothers in 1975, and we have mothers today. And I am so glad that the women in this room are the future of this country and our species. You all are witness to the impact of your families and on the concept of nurture itself with the, with the male-oriented, goal-oriented, masculine archetype that has driven Western civilization. What we see in our politics today, I don't care what aisle, side of the aisle people are on, what we see in politics today is the ultimate of the masculine archetype. It is short-sighted, goal-oriented, fight or flight. It is complete combat all the time. The archetype that we need to find within each of us, because we both have a masculine and feminine, we need to connect to the feminine archetype within each of us and realize that there is a demand coming from Mother Nature right now, that you wake up and connect to your nurture now, or you die as a species. 200,000 years, and our fertility rates combined with our chronic disease epidemics are predicting 60 to 70 years left. That's shorter than a single American lifespan expectancy. 60 to 70 years left, of human existence. Homo sapiens sapiens. And so the moment is here. It was really important that you guys, so many in the room, were supporting Rodale 10 years ago. Today, it is the most important thing you will do this year. It is the most important thing you will do with your life, is to connect to a farmer Connect to a human being who is accelerating their relationship with soil. The word soil science probably needs to be surpassed, and we need to realize soil connectivity. We need to realize that our technology of the future needs to be based on soil at every level. We do not need fiber optic systems and 5G. We have fungal communities around the world that can passage digital information through the water structure of fungi. I see a future where there are no lines, there's no power lines, there is no 5G. There is a relationship with fungi. And humans realize that we can speak through nature to one another around a globe that is actually tiny. Today we got to tour this farm. And there are intrepid spirits here on this farm. And I want to recognize for a moment the scientists that are out in the soils of this farm. Can you stand up if you are a soil scientist here at Rodale right now? Stand up, scientists. The most frightening thing that a scientist can do in their career is to step out of academia, to step away from the protected, hallowed, marbled, financed halls of academia and step out into a freaking farm field <laughs> on their own, dependent for their income on people who might or might not care about soil science in a country where most people have never even heard the word soil and science put together. These intrepid souls are supported by all of you. 
to become the tipping point of human history. Let me tell you, after years in academia, and in my current research, I have my own funded lab that I've completely self-funded over the last 10 years. We are at the, at the forefront of this relationship between human health and soil health that J.I. Rodale put out there to us. I can tell you that after meeting your scientists today and spending time with your leadership over the last year, there is no academia out there doing this work. There is nobody in the universities with all their funding and the CDC and the USDA and the EPA and all of those taxpayer dollars are not going to do soil research. Today we saw brand new data coming out two days ago that healthy soil leads to an increase protein density in the soil leads to this organic process. The organic process and regenerative agricultural practices leads to increased protein in the soil, which leads to an increase in nutrient density in the plant. That data is two freaking days old. How is it? How is it that a $17 trillion GDP is not paying somebody to freaking figure out if it's important to have healthy food. It is taking this intrepid body of people here at Rodale and many other, other groups around the country that I have been overjoyed to meet over the last couple of years. There are these intrepid farmers and PhDs in soil science that are getting together out in the fields and reinventing Western civilization without the plow. Jeff, can you stand up for a moment? Can we give Jeff a round of applause? Yes, man. This man is the biggest threat to Western civilization. Because he really pioneered the roller crimper that will replace the plow. You screwed it all up. 1,100 years, and you're going to reverse that. The people that are taking over, Jeff, the second Jeff, I love that you guys have real loyalty to the names here. So Jeff 1 and Jeff 2. Jeff 2 taking the helm now here. Chief Impact Officer. Ooh, what a title is that? Jeffy, Jeffy, you guys stand up. What? Yeah, come on. Better half. There you go. That's the whole job. You understand where we stand. I hope you walk out of here tonight realizing that you are the most influential person on the planet right now because you're one of just the select couple hundred people here tonight. Out of seven billion people, you showed up tonight giving up your busy schedules and the demands on your time, demands on your money, demands on your observations, attention, setting down your, your phones for a moment, to listen for a moment to the point in history that we're at. And you're a beautiful group of human beings. I'm honored to be in a room with you tonight. I can't believe we're here together. What stars aligned, what planets have moved, what history has unfolded, that we could share a meal together tonight. I learned in a very humbling way earlier this year from a, a couple, a husband and wife, that, that hail from Ikoria, Greece, a tiny little island in, in the Grecian islands. And Ikoria happens to be one of the, the blue zones on the planet, where the vast majority of the population lives past 100 years of age. And they, they were flown over to Virginia, the first time in the United States for this couple. They're, I still don't understand how old they are because their parents are in their 90s and, and their aunts and uncles are over 100. They looked like they were 40 or 50, but the math wasn't adding up. Either their parents had them in their 60s or they look way better than they are in age. But this young, mature couple took five days to, to forage in Northern Virginia to prepare a Grecian meal for us, a five course meal foraged from the, from the, the semi-urban environment that we were having this conference in. And they cooked for 18 of the speakers this meal, and it was epic. We were eating moss that had been flash 
fried in, in olive oil that they had brought over from Greece. I mean, I was eating things that I have never put in my mouth before. And I was in tears multiple times that night because every time we would start to put something in our mouth, the woman who prepared it would get up and tell us how much she loved every ingredient that she had put before us. And there was this heart, this love baked into every freaking bite of food. And I got up at the end of that to give a toast and I thought I was so brilliant and I was just so wizened in my moment. And I stood up and I was like, yeah, it's about the microbiome of the soil and a tribute to your farm. They, they run a 500 year old vineyard farm that feeds three families and their vineyard has been in their family for 500 years. And I give this, what I thought, eloquent speech on how their dedication to the soil and their plants was creating this wealth of knowledge and wisdom and nutrient in our bodies. I sat down after my toast and everybody cheered. And the gentleman got up very kindly from the Korea and he said, you are completely wrong. <laughs> I'm very used to being told I'm completely wrong by doctors. But by this guy, I was just heartbroken. I was like, how did I miss it completely? And he said, we don't live long in Korea because of the food we eat. We live long in Korea because we never set a dinner table without an extra empty chair with the expectation that somebody might show up. And most nights somebody does show up. And you are so overjoyed when they do because you can share your food with them. In the Korea, we never ever ask, what did you eat for dinner last night? But every morning when you're out walking and you're going to, the, to your work or you're going to the market, everybody always asks, who did you eat dinner with last night? Tonight I'm eating dinner with you. I'm touched by that. It's a huge gift that you decided to share your meal with us tonight. Can we have a round of applause for this kitchen? Woo! So we're human tonight. We're learning what that means. We don't even really know. We're so distracted, we're so not in the moment that we are, I think, really missing our species' own identity right now. And nowhere is that more evident than in medicine where we are actually facing the largest epidemic in history of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease means that your body has mistook your body as the enemy and your immune system is destroying your own body because of a loss of self-identity. It is one of the most fast-growing sectors of chronic disease in America is a loss of self-identity at the immune system level. That is profound. And what we have found out, amazingly, is that the reason for this is the death of the microbiome. Our laboratory has been showing that it is the microbiome and its digestion of nutrients in the environment that makes the communication network, a wireless communication network, that creates and supports the tight junction barrier systems that separate human from outside world. Homo sapiens sapiens is only true, is only clearly identified if the microbiome is living in it and within it. And if you lose the microbiome, nature has so designed you that you will lose your self-identity and you will die. You will die destroying yourself. Your immune system will destroy you, Homo sapiens sapiens, through the checks and balances that were brilliantly put in place by Mother Nature to say, if we will endow this species with this level of responsibility and opportunity for wisdom, we're gonna check its behavior to make sure that it never sees itself more important than the, the whole. And if it ever makes that mistake and starts to march against Mother Nature as a whole, and if it starts to dump so much toxin to destroy the planet itself at the soil level, at the beginning of biology itself, then the species will destroy itself through its own immune system. That is eloquent. It is beautiful design. It is well-deserved suffering but it is not well-deserved that our children are paying the highest toll. Larry and the audience here, myself and a number of others last week were testifying before the EPA on Roundup. Good effort, zero effect. 
I'm going to tell you what that experience feels like when you show them 96 scientific experiments from universities all over the world and independent laboratories all over the world that this chemical is destroying our children. First and foremost, the generational studies on Roundup are showing that if we inject small amounts of Roundup under the skin of a rat, there is no measurable deficit in that rat by the time it dies. Except if we then follow the pups that came from that rat, in the second generation, they are burdened with massive metabolic collapse. They have obesity, they have diabetes, they have inability to, to uh, heal correctly, their immune system dysfunctions, and then you follow the third generation. And in the third generation, you only expose the species once at the grandparent, and the third generation is born, still born, dead, birth defects, or rampant cancers. The children today are being housed in the largest hospital system that I've ever set foot in, that has actually ever been built in human history. The largest hospital system is down in Houston, MD Anderson, University of Texas. And if you go to MD Anderson, University of Texas Children's Hospital, you will see a metropolis. These 20, 30 story buildings, not one, but six of these massive towers in this huge network, this city has been built to treat the cancers of our children who are the third generation of Roundup babies. We couldn't detect it in 1975 when my hippie parents started eating Roundup in, in inadvertently. They looked pretty good. We ate granola every day because that's all my mom knew how to make. We ate liver and onions because that's all we could afford. It was an awesome hippie family in Boulder, Colorado, and I, there was no signs of problem. And then in my generation, my generation, my four siblings, myself and my three siblings, our four have had to work so hard to stay healthy. We are spending so much money on supplements and special diet plans, and we're, we're exercising like no generation before us ever had to do it to stay healthy. And so we've had to invest massive amount of effort to stay healthy. And our children, born with eczema and autism and Alzheimer's, and brewing up in, in our in our generations of, of, ahead of us. And so we have this situation of collapse and we've proved it scientifically that this is exactly what's driving this, is the infiltration of herbicides and pesticides in our food system and the EPA crickets. In fact, they told Larry and I last week and the rest of our group, you're wasting your time right now. Maybe come back in four years and see if it's a different environment but you're wasting your time right now because we literally have no regulatory method for taking your 96 st studies and turning that into a legislative decision. There is literally no mechanism. You would have to complete a, a process that would take you two to three years just to prepare the document for us to be able to turn these science things into a regulatory decision. And we said, no problem, we'll do that. Where's the template? It is on your website. No, we don't publish the template for that document. Well, where do we find that template? Well, there isn't really a template, but you could find examples of documents that have been created maybe on PubMed. Well, can you direct us there? No, nothing specific. And so here you have the regulatory agency that's mandated to protect our children saying, we can't make the decision based on science. We have to make it based on a regulatory document, and we're not going to show you how to make that document. And so we are here tonight, humans to say that we are not the result of our legislation. We are not the result of governments. We are the result of a spiritual phenomenon that somehow binds ancient souls into these human bodies of ours for a moment. And we have seven and a half billion humans who have jumped into the experiment right now. Which means somehow, if you believe in souls, seven and a half billion souls decided to travel the universe, to step into a child's body, knowing that 52% of those bodies will have a disease before they hit adulthood. Knowing that, they jump in. Can you imagine being a soul that says, hell yeah, give me that autistic journey. I am happy to jump into body, and I will be in such suffering at 18 months of age that I will be inconsolable and I will have a callus on my forehead from trying to inflict enough pain so that I can focus. Give me that journey. I want to be there because humanity is at its tipping point and I want that showdown. 
I want to see if I can help tip human consciousness into its full potential of sapiens sapiens. Can we become sapiens sapiens sapiens? Can we finally add a wisdom to our self-proclaimed wisdom? And can we embrace our moment as humanity and create a different future through a higher consciousness that would see us singular with our soils and our mother natures, not against it? This is my dream, that we would create something like that. And I have a very unique opportunity because of the travel schedule my team has been willing to do the last 24 hours. Last night we were sitting in a barn very similar to this, arrayed in such beauty and lights and fancy things around into this barn. And we were just north of San Francisco, 300 amazing people in the audience, just as we have tonight. And I'm going to take you through an exercise that we did last night on the West Coast. It only takes us a minute. And I want to do it because I think we can change the history of the planet and the Homo sapiens sapien journey with this 60 seconds. I don't know if you've experienced the power of intention in your life before. I don't know if you've realized that you can manifest your own future. Can you stand up, Eugene? This gentleman has manifested his own future. Can we have a round of applause for this scientist? Here's a man who began his journey in China, recognizing that this huge explosion of wealth in China was driving an explosion of disease and toxicity in the Chinese countrysides and peoples. You can sit down, thank you. This story might take a minute, I didn't want to get tired. <laughs> and then in that moment, uh, where of that recognition, he started to wake up and ask himself challenging questions of, is it possible that Western civilization is starting to kill itself? Is China suffering now under a massive toxicity because of our marriage and intention of copying and reproducing all of the toxicity that planet would do and, and producing it faster and cheaper and better? He intentioned a career and life in rural Pennsylvania, in China. And he manifested this in April of this year. He had to take a journey through education in his biology in China, to his PhD in Australia, two different major cities in Australia, to the University of Wisconsin in Madison for a year and a half there before he had the opportunity to end up at his dream job. To be at Rodale Institute and push the future forward Here's a man who knows how to manifest his future. And so let's manifest something tonight. Let's manifest a future for our species. And so I ask you to close your eyes right now. If your legs are crossed, just put your both feet on the ground. Straighten up your spine a little bit. And close your eyes. The power of this is fascinating. I want you to picture Mother Earth and our species in it in 200 years. In 200 years, I want you to imagine the cities as we know them dissolving back into the landscape, reabsorbed by the fungi and the bacteria, the soil itself, and manifest in its place our seascapes, cityscapes, and countrysides that show bizarre looking buildings that are not made of plastics and toxic chemically compound laden materials but actually made of beds of fungi that are arranged in vertical and horizontal pa patterns such that domiciles are built homes supported and created within and co-created with the microbiome almost like cave dwellers but picture some sort of super modern California cave dweller with wide open windows, indoor outdoor lifestyles. And humanity is growing so much nutrient dense foods in our backyards, just as we did 60 years ago, that there is no need to ship foods around the planet anymore. And there's no need to really work because there's an exchange of value in everybody's productivity as we communicate not through 5G cell phones, 
but for, through the fun, fungal systems that have learned to, to communicate with us. And our brains have integrated at frequency levels where we can literally put data into the soil beds and have that data extracted on the other side of the globe. We learn to embed human intention and person and co-creation within Mother Nature. Make sure there's children running in your mind right now. We want new children in 200 years. The patter of feet. The beauty of their laughter. This is our planet in 200 years. Such ease. The species has started to forget the concept of war because there is no concept of global governments, nationalities. We've finally blended into Mother Nature to realize we are a unified species that is singular with our nature and only defined in our self-identity by the presence of that nature. You are envisioning the future. Last night I was on the stage with Paul Hawk and, and he said the line that would inspire this vision. He said, right now, those of us that are engaged in conversation around soil and regenerative agriculture are literally rehearsing the future. As you visualize 200 years from now, you're literally rehearsing a future for your great, great, great grandchildren. You're visualizing a future. You are rehearsing it in your mind. And I would ask that you start to make a practice of this. Oftentimes we feel totally hopeless against the powers and monetary systems that be. But let me tell you that as you start to kind of come back into the present time and we start to open our eyes to one another, I can guarantee you that nobody is actually sitting in rooms like this, 250, 300 people to, at a time on two coasts within the same 24 hour period, visualizing and rehearsing our future. That means the opposite is not doing this to defeat our vision tonight. Clorox, Monsanto, these mega industries of Bayer and Merck, they're busy checking on their quarterly profits. They have no time to visualize what the earth looks like in 200 years. We could beat them at all of their own games by playing the long game here. Let's start rehearsing a future that is so far out in the distance that there will be no Fortune 500 companies left. There will only be homo sapiens sapiens joyfully participating in projects together because we are a creative freaking species. We love producing and creating stuff. But if we do it by the template of Mother Nature, what will we create? There's examples in this room of women who are creating clothing companies in line with Mother Nature. There's examples of people who are creating consumer products made out of 100% you know, nature design materials. It is so at our fingertips to live it all differently, to plow a completely different future. And I ask you to please every morning and evening, or at least one of the two, make it a practice to start rehearsing the future for our great, great grandchildren. And we will manifest even that which we don't know how to get to yet. We will manifest a future that is completely different than the day we have today. And I'm so grateful to have shared dinner with you. I want to turn you loose back into your world to have a huge impact. Thank you for supporting Rodale, these scientists, and the world among us.